evening and aloha. This is Congressman Ed Case. Um, I am coming to you uh, tonight from my office uh, just off uh, the U.S. Capitol in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, yes, it's late uh, here in Washington, D.C. It's 11 o'clock. Uh, I am not feeling so bad because I just red-eyed in from Honolulu uh, to work uh, this week in, in Congress. Uh, we had votes tonight. Uh, and so the work week has uh, started. So I, I'm feeling okay, other than perhaps sleeping on a plane all night. Um, and so, um, you know, one of the critical things that we're gonna be doing this week, uh, which will come up in our conversation tonight is uh, uh, to take up President Biden's proposed uh, American Rescue Plan, which uh, includes a great deal of money uh, going to the subjects that we're gonna talk about uh, here tonight. And so that's what we're doing here in Washington is debating that and, and passing, uh, passing those measures along. Um, tonight, I want to focus with you on a particularly critical um, topic as we all deal with uh, COVID-19, and that is uh, vaccines and vaccinations. You know, I looked through back through my calendar right before we started because I thought to myself, it's been exactly a year since my first congressional briefing on this thing called the novel coronavirus. And sure enough, there it was, January 29th of uh, 2020. Uh, when, when the, um, the whole US Congress came together for the first time for a, a briefing on what was going on. And of course, uh, since then, it's been a very long and very, very difficult um, a year for our world, uh, for our country and for our Hawaii. Um, in the United States, we now have had about 26 million cases with almost 450,000 deaths now, 441 to be exact. And um, you know, it, it could be higher, it could be lower depending on on you know, uh, how you define COVID related uh, deaths, but it's a hell of a lot of uh, our fellow citizens. And in Hawaii, of course, a 25,000 cases, about 407 uh, deaths to date. Um, it's been a crisis on multiple levels. Of course, public health, at first and foremost, it's a crisis of public health that has led to a crisis of, of economic uh, proportion uh, where we have been harder hit uh, than anywhere else in the country. And then finally, just a social and community and personal crisis for many, many um, of uh, us and our, and our families and our, and our fellow citizens and, and folks throughout the, the country, much less the world. And um, you know, from my perspective, and I think most people would say this, the, the solution uh, to COVID-19 starts and ends with public health. If you don't take care of public health, you don't take care of anything else. And so the question is, well, how do we uh, focus on uh, you know, public health? We're all very well familiar with the uh, CDC guidelines and advice, uh, masks, uh, social distancing, uh, the enforcements and guidelines and, and restrictions that we've all lived under for, for a year. Um, and we are all uh, starting to be familiar with some of the variations of public health being the variants uh, that uh, my guests tonight will try to explain to you their top of mind to all of us uh, as this virus mutates, as viruses uh, do. Um, but really, if you want to take a look at the ultimate answer on the public health side, it is vaccinations. It is to vaccinate uh, as many of us uh, uh, in Hawaii nationally and in the world as safely and as uh, efficiently and as expeditiously and a as we possibly can. Uh, really, all roads uh, lead to vaccinations, and that's where our focus has to be. So tonight, I just want to talk uh, vaccines and vaccinations with you. Uh, who, what, when, why, how, uh, federal, state, and local level. Uh, try to answer your questions. I uh, try to clear up some confusion that uh, I certainly hear in my office. I've got two great special guests uh, to help me uh, with that that are, that are on your screen. Uh, first, we have uh, Dr. Jennifer Boothia. Uh, Dr. Boothia is a specialist in allergy and uh, clinical immunology, uh, informatics, and pediatrics. Uh, she actually had a career with the Army. Uh, she just retired um, as a colonel with the Army, where she specialized in telemedicine as well as clinical concerns and education regarding vaccines. Uh, she's a product of Brown University in, uh, in Rhode Island. Uh, and her Army career actually started at Tripler Army Medical Center in Honolulu. And so she's very, very well familiar with us here. She's been assigned um, in places like Germany, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, served uh, in her army time as one of the medical directors for the Vaccine Healthcare Centers Network, a, a Department of Defense agency. Uh, and uh, she is currently um, a clinical informatics physician at the Queens Medical Center in Hawaii and does telemedicine education uh, with the Pacific Basin Telehealth Resource Center. And she can tell you what clinical informatics physician means, but it's basically <laughs> translating 
all of the scientific health stuff uh, into um, your understanding, I, I suspect and hope. Um, thank you so much for being with us, Doctor. Uh, Hilton Rathel, I think many of you will recognize him. He's been on the, <clears throat> on the TV uh, more than any other politi any politician in Hawaii over the last year, it seems like. Uh, Hilton is the president and CEO of the Health Healthcare Association of Hawaii, which is the umbrella organization of about 170 healthcare organizations throughout our entire state. So these organizations include our primary big hospitals uh, to small mid-sized hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, adult residential care homes, uh, home health agencies, and hospices. And so this is, this is the, the organization of our healthcare providers uh, throughout um, uh, Hawaii. Uh, Hilton has more than 30 years of experience in the healthcare industry uh, here in Southern California. has been here for two decades now, contributing to us in many different um, uh, areas, um, has worked uh, for, for many years as an executive with um, HMSA, as well as Hawaii Pacific Health. Uh, <clears throat> he has a BS in psychology, a master's in public health, and a master's in health administration. <clears throat> so we've got two great people here to try to Try to get into the area of specialty and help me answer, answer your questions. In terms of our uh, agenda tonight, just quickly on uh, the logistics, um, each of us is going to give you about five or ten minutes uh, uh, on the big picture of what we're involved in, um, and then we'll we'll try to answer some questions that we got, uh, you know, before before this presentation, and and some obvious questions that are coming up all the time, and then we want to turn this over to you for your own questions. You can ask your questions in two ways. Number one, uh, you, are, you, you are welcome to put it into the comment section uh, in Facebook where you're, where you're watching right now and, and we'll get the questions over to us. Um, or <clears throat> if you prefer, you can email them directly to me and the address is edcase.events at mail.house.gov. Edcase, just straight through, edcase, no period, edcase.events. E-V-E-N-T-S at mail, M-A-I-L dot house dot gov. Uh, you can try that one out. Um, you can also, uh, for further information on any of this, go to my website, case.house.gov. So with that <clears throat> uh, introduction, I'm gonna start out and give you an overview um, in my on the federal side, uh, federal uh, legislation, federal policy, federal funding uh, of this uh, incredible effort that we have undertaken. Uh, to vaccinate uh, as many of the citizens of our country and residents of our country as we possibly can. Um, and obviously it's a huge undertaking. Not only did we not have a COVID-19 vaccine six months ago, uh, so we had to go through that exercise of actually um, getting vaccines that are available uh, to help out, uh, but we had to, but now we have to find a way to vaccinate somewhere in the range of 330 million plus people throughout our country in a very short period of time, in as safe a way as possible, and in a way that will actually be effective to develop uh, that uh, herd immunity uh, to COVID-19. That is, is our goal here, to protect each of us individually as well as collectively, uh, to such an extent that we can start to resume a normal life of interaction with each other uh, with, with uh, precautions uh, still in place, but nonetheless, uh, to start to open us uh, up our society and our communities and our businesses uh, again. Um, and <clears throat> the federal uh, effort really has a couple of different uh, legs to it. The first is just straight regulatory. How do you get a vaccine uh, developed and approved? Um, that, um, that is uh, no, small, no small feat, especially if you are uh, trying to develop a vaccine in such a short period of time that you know you're gonna have to give to a lot of people. It needs to be safe, it needs to work. Um, second, we have to make sure that that vaccine is manufactured at that scale. And then finally, we have to make sure that the vaccine is distributed out to all of the states. Now here, I wanna make a very, very important uh, point that is uh, often a subject of, of confusion. Um, under the way we do it in our country, our federal government uh, takes care of the regulatory side uh, oversees the manufacturer of the vaccine and pays for it, by the way, uh, and distributes the vaccine out to the states and pays for the distribution to the states. But at that point, the states take over. Uh, and for the most part, it's not, it's not true across the board, but the states take over and the states actually 
set the priorities within within each of their uh, jurisdictions, uh, set the distribution, uh, set the rules. Uh, and one could argue about whether that's good policy or not. Other countries do it differently. Other countries have a much more centralized national approach. We have simply, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, um, done it differently. And so that's the, that's the horse we're riding right now. Uh, and so the bottom line here is that I can talk federal. At some point, it, it becomes uh, primarily a responsibility of, of our governor and of the folks uh, in the state, the Department of Health and, and, and uh, the Healthcare Association of Hawaii and others. Uh, and so uh, that's important to keep in mind here as we go through this. In terms of approval, the approving agency is the US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, uh, which is responsible for the review and approval of all drugs, um, or at least all drugs that um, are at the level where if we didn't do it right, they could harm people. And we need to be sure that they are, are done in a way that uh, is, is both safe and um, efficient and effective. Um, we, as you know now, I believe we all know that we have two vaccines that are approved, one Pfizer, one Moderna. Uh, they are approved under a process called an emergency use authorization, an EUA. Usually the approval of drugs takes a lot longer uh, than these, but there is a procedure uh, under which in emergencies, and this is an emergency, uh, a drug can receive uh, uh, approval and, and permission really to, to administer subject to very strict regulation um, after, the, after the fact to make sure that everything is, is going okay. And so uh, Pfizer and Moderna um, are approved uh, with EUAs. Uh, as I think we all know at this point, those are two doses. You have to have two doses to have the, 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 the effect of, of the vaccine uh, uh, be, be realized. Um, we also have um, other uh, manufacturers that are that are in the process of, of developing uh, their vaccines. Uh, we have two that are about ready to uh, come out. Um, they are pending. They're about to go. One of them probably very shortly will we'll have EUA emergency use authorization. That is Johnson and Johnson. That's a one dose vaccine. The doctor will correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure, but uh, uh, so far so good. And then um, uh, Novavax. Uh, which uh, is a little bit behind Johnson and Johnson. So we may well still, we may well soon have uh, more than two, um, and they have different uh, qualities to them in different conditions. Two, two doses versus one. What kind of uh, vaccine? How do they work? Uh, and the doctor can uh, uh, get into that. So that's the approval process. Two approved, a few more in the pipeline. In terms of production and distribution uh, so far, and remember that it's only been just a little over one month really uh, since, uh, since approval was given. Uh, and these uh, drug manufacturers actually commenced manufacturing uh, because they wanted to get it out there um, uh, before approval. If that approval didn't come through, then they were gonna eat that. Uh, but as it did, the approval did come through. So they had a little bit of a head start, but nonetheless, we are still very, very early and the, the level of distribution that we need to, to get to widespread immunization in our country. Um, now we have um, distributed somewhere in the range of 50 million um, doses of, of these vaccines, uh, of which about 33 million have actually been um, administered. Um, only about 6 million or so, uh, both doses so far. So a pretty small number. Uh, but more in the pipeline, we've got about 26, 27 million that have had one dose and, and, and those doses are usually separated by three weeks or so. And so we've got, um, you know, a rapid ramp up, uh, at least in the, in the, in the, not only the, the distribution, but also uh, the dosage. Uh, in Hawaii so far, uh, we've had about 108,000 uh, vaccinated, uh, which is um, still uh, and, and of those, a very small percentage, only about 2% uh, fully vaccinated, uh, but about 7-8% uh, partially. And so that is uh, um, uh, coming along nonetheless, um, 108,000 um, uh, doses uh, out of 1.4 million people is still uh, significantly less than what we need to get anywhere close to um, uh, an effective uh, uh, statewide uh, vaccination. So, and that, by the way, is about average for, for the um, for the states out there. So we're not particularly lagging and we're not particularly ahead of anybody. Uh, Milton, if you, if you wanna correct me on that, um, uh, that's my understanding at least. Um, the, um, um, 
State Department of Health uh, and, uh, specifies the priorities. I think we all know that we're in the prioritization of, of, of frontline workers first, uh, 75 years old plus uh, second, and then uh, presumably working down from there into uh, 65 uh, plus um, and, and into other categories and as fast as possible. Nonetheless, that has been the priority, which is not unusual um, uh, for the country. A lot of times people ask, well, why are other states already administering the 65 plus? Uh, and the answer is uh, effect effectively because I believe at least, uh, this, is, this is my understanding and interpretation. Uh, they got um, a little bit farther ahead of the curve than, than we did. They had a, perhaps a different prioritization as I went into it. And as you'll see, um, there was uh, some real confusion in December, primarily uh, as to whether further vaccine was coming or not. Um, in December, it was understood that there was a substantial pipeline uh, uh, still out there uh, coming through uh, and states made a plan uh, based on the expectation that they would get uh, that vaccination, uh, uh, but um, uh, that didn't happen. Uh, it wasn't there. And so that caused a lot of states to have to kind of stop and start, uh, which is what happened uh, to, to us to some extent uh, in Hawaii and Hilton can clear that up. Um, this all has to be paid for. Your, your federal government is paying uh, for this. Uh, we have uh, paid a great deal of money for the manufacture and distribution uh, of vaccines uh, in both, uh, well, not both, but uh, a little bit in the CARES Act that we passed back in March, some of the residual money. But more than that, uh, really in the appropriations that we passed uh, in the th fourth quarter of, of last year, especially the 900 um, billion dollar um, second emergency assistance package that we passed just in December, just about six weeks ago. Of that money, a lot went to the states to help them with the distribution. Um, and in Hawaii, we saw somewhere in the range of 15, 20 million dollars, which was uh, provided to the Hawaii uh, to assist with uh, in-state distribution. Uh, the idea being clearly that states like Hawaii and all states really uh, were in such dire straits from, uh, from a budgetary perspective that you could you could deliver the vaccine to the airport, uh, you know, under the international airport, but if the states had no money to distribute after that, then all of the effort was gonna be lost. And so the federal government is assisting uh, states and, and communities in terms of that uh, distribution. It is not enough. That's one of the things that we're debating um, this week, as a matter of fact, as part of the American Rescue Plan is further assistance uh, to states to assist in, in vaccine uh, distribution. Now, how do we get to, um, you know, from, from the 50 million up to the, to the level where we're actually uh, uh, vaccinating and immunizing um, uh, hundreds of millions of Americans as opposed to tens of millions, uh, a million uh, in our state plus as opposed to just 100,000? Uh, well, number one, there is an incredible amount of uh, vaccine that is in the pipeline for production at this point. Uh, and as you may have seen, President Biden just a few days ago directed uh, a substantial increase uh, so that we have, uh, for example, um, just looking at some of the stats that I pulled up for this, um, I think we've got about 300 million Moderna um, uh, vaccines in the pipeline of which about 200,000 by the end of June. Uh, for Pfizer, 300 million, 200,000 by the end, 200 million rather by the end of May. Uh, <clears throat> Johnson & Johnson, um, about 100 million, assuming approval uh, by the end of June, and Novavax, 100 million. Uh, so you can see that um, the figures are starting to ramp up very, very fast. Uh, and, and the challenge that we all have is to keep that production going and the distribution going. In terms of timing, um, still a moving target in many ways, but uh, uh, the the, 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 the goal and the expectation is that uh, once we got into the second quarter of this year, we would start to really see a tremendous uh, ramp up in terms of the number of folks that uh, were, were uh, being vaccinated and the availability of the vaccine so that we could start to get uh, by the middle of uh, this year, um, if we all, um, if, if everything goes right, including people getting vaccinated, where we would get a significant uh, percentage, 50% uh, plus or more uh, upwards of the herd immunity that we need uh, to actually start to start to get to where we need to get to uh, somewhere around um, the middle of this year. Um, 
one of the things that's happened in Hawaii is that uh, that um, there has been um, uh, previously not enough really notice to Hawaii of of how much vaccine was coming in and so when people could expect to get their first or their second shot. And so um, you can many people have had this experience where they have had uh, vaccination appointments canceled. That was simply because uh, the look ahead, the expected look ahead, uh, did not uh, see that there was less vaccine coming in uh, than actually proved to be the case. What the Biden administration is committed to do now is to give states a three-week look ahead. Uh, so in other words, you can expect that for the next three weeks, you're going to be getting this much uh, vaccine, and that should help uh, to keep appointments a little bit more certain, especially the second one, because once you get the first one, if you don't get the second one, uh, in a timely way, you, you you don't have that effect. So the advanced notice uh, is very, very careful. I mean, a very, very um, important. Um, we have very specific issues in Hawaii. We also need to be very, very conscious of. Uh, we have a minority populations in Hawaii that are that are highly susceptible to the COVID uh, uh, virus. Uh, uh, many of our Native Hawaiian, uh, Filipino American, Pacific Islander, Islander communities uh, have higher susceptibility and so need to be extra careful and we need to uh, be sensitive to that as we go out there and educate and, and, and vaccinate. Um, we have rural, rural parts of our uh, state that simply can't wander down to Queens one, at, one afternoon or to the Blaisdell Center and, and get a vaccine. It's much harder to do. So we're having to push this out into community health centers as an example. Uh, to, to get the vaccine to some of the some of the places in our state that are much harder to do that. Um, so um, I think I talked already about uh, the American Rescue Plan that we are uh, debating uh, and hoping to pass in the next three weeks. Uh, but this would include uh, about twenty billion dollars more for a national vaccine program, in partnership with the states, fifty billion in, in testing and tracing. Uh, about 100,000 more public health workers across the country who are very, very uh, critical to, to, to vaccine, uh, to, to help vaccinate in part, um, and other monies that are very important for us to carry this out. So the bottom line here is that from the federal perspective, we're trying to move as fast as we can to make sure the, the, the vaccine is safely approved, uh, manufactured, and distributed to the states uh, so that the states can get it out throughout um, our citizens uh, as fast and effectively and safely as possible and as fairly as possible, uh, I would say, uh, with the money that states need uh, to be able to do that. Um, so that's um, that's a little bit of my report. Um, and I, I hope that um, gave you some sense of the issues that, that we're dealing with here in Washington, D.C. Um, what I think I'd like to do now is turn this over to, to Hilton Rathel to talk a little bit about, okay, I ha I'm handing it off to you at, from, from, at the airport here. How's it going uh, from there, from the federal perspective? Um, you know, what, what, is, what is the prioritization? I think people always want to know what is the prioritization? Um, how is that, um, you know, set? Uh, how is it working out? Um, you know, when can I expect uh, to, to have a vaccine available? And from my perspective, I'm always asking myself, um, what more can I do to help the state uh, and all of the communities that are that are that are involved in this uh, with your needs, whether it be, you know, obviously federal funding is the primary one, but um, there's other areas as well. So, so Hilton, why don't you take it for a little while, and then and then we'll turn it over. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Case. Do appreciate the opportunity and appreciate all the work you're doing on behalf of the people of Hawaii. Um, in terms of prioritization, um, as you mentioned, it's a very challenging topic. There is no one way to do this right. Different countries are doing it differently. The states are doing it fairly consistently. And what we have decided in the United States is to first start off with healthcare personnel. So people working in hospitals um, and large institutions were vaccinated. They were some of the first people on the list and also because of the inordinate impact of COVID-19 on elderly, especially in congregate settings such as care homes, we've all pr also prioritized our long-term care facility residents and their staff. And so we've gone into the skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, adult care, uh, care residential homes, community care homes, foster homes, 
And then in addition, not only have we gone in and vaccinated uh, staff in our hospitals, we also have what we call the unaffiliated healthcare providers. So that's doctors, dentists, physical therapists, people who work health in healthcare out in the community. And we are on the tail end of vaccinating about 31,000 people in Hawaii who are what we're calling unaffiliated healthcare providers. So they're not, they don't work at a hospital or large uh, institutional setting, but they're out there, they're providing healthcare and it even includes acupuncturists, for example. So anyone who works in healthcare and their staff, they're being vaccinated right now. So most of those, and that's all of 1A, and almost everyone in that category, which is the hospitals, all our skilled nursing facilities, our care homes, and our unaffiliated healthcare providers, they have almost all received at least their first vaccine and many are starting to receive their second vaccine. Now we're also working and have been for a few weeks on, on the next category, which is our first responders, police, fire workers, uh, firefighters, ambulance workers. They have generally all been vaccinated and had their first, if not their second shots. And then we've also been working on adults 75 years and older. And again, that's a vulnerable population. And so we're working on those. And we're also working on what we call frontline essential workers. Now, that's a more challenging population in the sense that there is a lot of people who are considered frontline essential workers. And so the challenge is, okay, well, we can't vaccinate all of those. We don't have enough vaccine right now to vaccinate all of those. How do you decide? And that's a challenge and that's being determined state by state. Our Department of Health here under Dr. Libby Char and her team, I believe they've done quite a remarkable job actually in terms of managing this vaccination and what we're doing in the state. It's a very challenging situation. There are decisions being made hourly, daily, and weekly. And so, for example, right now, there are a lot of teachers getting vaccinated, but there's about 45,000 personnel just in the Department of Education. And so we've had to prioritize them. And so they, the Department of Health is working with the Department of Education to figure out well, how within those 45,000 workers, who are most vulnerable, who are most at risk. And then we're going to be moving on to, as Representative Case talked about, or Congressman Case talked about, adults 65 to 74. And then the next category is going to be people who are 16 to 64 with high risk medical conditions and other essential workers. And then you go down into the young and healthy population. But we're going to, we're quite away from getting to that group. So, in terms of distribution, how are we getting the vaccine out there? Well, um, the congressman mentioned a couple of the facilities. Many of the major hospitals, if not most of the major hospitals in the state, have agreed to be what we call hospital vaccination hubs. Now, you've heard about Hawaii Pacific Health and Queens, and they're doing a fantastic job, but there are other hospitals as well. There's Wilcox and KVMH on Kauai. There's Maui Health System on, on Maui. There's Kona, Hilo, and North Hawaii Community Hospitals on on the Big Island, and there's Adventist Health Castle and Kaiser also on Oahu. So all of those sites are hospital vaccination hubs. Most of the hospitals are doing it on their own campuses, but some like Hawaii Pacific Health have, have gotten Pier 2 using Pier 2, and Queens is using the Blaisdell Center. Now, in addition to those hospital vaccination hubs, the federally qualified health centers, or a number of those are also vaccinating um, some very high risk populations as well. We have the district health officers who are working and are setting up some pods on the neighbor islands. And we have the private pharmacies, a number of private pharmacies who have contracted with the Department of Health and are going into the, what we call the mom and pop community care homes and foster homes out in the community. And then there are some other DOH Department of Health pods as well. Now, in terms of allocation, Right now, this month, well, actually in January, Hawaii was getting about roughly 33,000 doses a week total, you know, which sounds like a lot. That's about 132,000 a month. Now that's both Pfizer and Moderna. So we've been getting about 33 doses a month. Now it did take a while. It only started in, Jan in December. We only started to get the vaccines in December. 
So it took a while to get everyone ramped up. Now, the good news is that right now, this week, we could vaccinate over 100,000 people in Hawaii. We have the capacity across the state to administer over 100,000 doses a week. The challenge is we're only getting around 30 some thousand doses a week. So we could, we actually have the capacity right now to vaccinate three, pe three times as many people as we're actually vaccinating. And Congressman, you just talked about the visibility and it's gonna be great when we get the visibility, but when I checked in with the Department of Health today, we do not know today, Tuesday yet, what we're going to be getting next week. Now we anticipate next week we'll probably get as much as we got this week. And it will be great though when we have that three weeks visibility that the, the Biden administration is talking about. And we look forward to that in terms of planning. But just to give you an idea, we've done the math and we've built the models. And if we, based on what we've already vaccinated and the numbers are a little higher congressman than what you had, We've actually vaccinated close to 170,000 people as of today in the state of Hawaii, which is good. That's very, very good. Now that's 170,000, uh, sorry, 100, yeah, 170,000 in the civilian population. Tripler and the VA are also vaccinating. They have their own supplies. So they, we don't know what their numbers are, but there's some VA and DOD personnel, Department of Defense personnel, in addition to that 170,000. So we're actually doing pretty well as a state, but if we wanted to get, and Congressman, you talked about that herd immunity. If we wanted to get to a 75% of the population, now the eligible population in Hawaii right now is anyone 16 and above because it's not being tested on children. There are tests being done right now by Moderna or the trials being done by Moderna and Pfizer on, on those younger populations that right now it's only recommended for 16 and older. So if we were to get to 75% of the population by June, we would have to um, vaccinate because everyone needs two doses. We would have to vaccinate over 400,000 or administer 400,000 doses a month to get to vaccinate 75% of the population by June. If we wanted to va vaccinate 75% by September, we would need to do 235,000 doses a week sorry, a month to get to that. Now, the good news is we can do that. We have the capacity, we just don't have the vaccine. So that's about where we are right now. We have a lot of capacity. We have about three times more capacity than we have vaccine. We understand, we know the Biden administration is working incredibly hard to get the supplies up. But right now we could, if we had the supplies, we could vaccinate three times as many people as we are. And that would get us, that means by, if the supplies build up, it's still gonna take June, July, maybe August, depending on the supplies, before we've got about 75% of the population vaccinated. So Congressman, let me turn it back over to you, thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for correcting me on um, under 16. That was a very important point that needed to be clarified. We're definitely working on that side of it from an approval perspective, but that, that does change the equation of how fast you get to 75% of the above 16 population. Okay, uh, Dr. Buthia, why don't you take it away for a while? Tell us a little bit, about, aside from what your job title means, because <laughs> I, I promised everybody we would explain that, but um, why don't you, I guess, what I hear the most is just the, the really basic scientific stuff, you know, like, why is this so important? Um, um, am I, am I, you know, safe? Uh, I don't have to do anything once I get the immunity. Uh, do I have to wear a mask anymore? Um, and, and, you know, I, I think we have to be pretty straight about this. Uh, there was a, a you know, a, a recent uh, poll, which is, I think, I think, as I recall, was a Hawaii poll, but it's consistent with national uh, polling that uh, maybe 50% of folks are, are want to get the vaccine as soon as they can, and, and, and 50% are a little uh, kind of low about it still, unsure, and 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 a, a, a large percentage are still uh, quite skeptical for whatever reason. And so, you know, from your scientific perspective, with all of those, you know, specializations and degrees and all that kind of stuff, you know, what is, what's the answer there? 
So why don't you just take it away and, and what are the questions you get all the time and what do you want people to know about vaccinations? All right, let me make sure I'm off mute. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Case, uh, for the invitation and the opportunity uh, to utilize this platform to really spread some additional um, clinical education about immunizations. Uh, so in my current role, I am a clinical informaticist and really that ties together my clinical knowledge as a physician with data and health IT. So uh, I'm not an IT nerd, I'm a data nerd. Um, and I also love immunology and I love vaccines. I love vaccine history. And what that history has shown us is that vaccinations work as a public health initiative, whether it's smallpox eradication or polio eradication. Um, vaccinations are really an important component of that. Um, so there are two uh, vaccines available, as you mentioned. Um, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is the one that is um, that was tested in ages 16 years and up. The Moderna vaccine was actually 18 years and up. So uh, patients between the ages of 16 uh, up to the age of 18 um, would be getting the Pfizer vaccine. Um, and that may, may impact where uh, people go to schedule once the window opens for that lower age limit. Um, as you've already said, sir, both vaccines require two doses in order to reach 95% efficacy. And efficacy is another way of saying how much the vaccine protects people from getting the disease. Um, overall, in the vaccine immunology community, we are happy with like a C minus grade. So when the data came out about the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines getting an A plus, um, it was incredibly exciting. And it was really reassuring um, with regards to how this vaccine could help get us through the public health emergency and really go, uh, you know, kind of help to create herd immunity. Um, so these vaccines are actually very safe. Um, we know this not only from the phase three clinical trials, but also with the millions of doses that have already been administered um, outside of those phase three trials. You've already said health and, um, you know, we're getting close to 200,000 doses being administered here in Hawaii. Um, like I said, I'm a data nerd. So I have gone through and looked at the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, for the state of Hawaii. And the most common side effects that are reported are actually common side effects with vaccines. So pain at your injection site, headache, fatigue, muscle aches, uh, fever, chills. Those can happen with pretty much any vaccine. It's your immune system being stimulated. And when I last checked, um, there was only one report listed in VAERS of a case of anaphylaxis, which is a significant allergic reaction. Um, but I, I do know that within the Queen's Health System, um, they have administered uh, over 35,000 vaccine doses and have had no uh, events of anaphylaxis within those vaccines that have been administered. Uh, so from a safety standpoint, um, I feel very confident. I have received the vaccine. I have received both doses. Um, and given my experience with the military and a very broad variety of vaccines, um, the side effects that I felt were really no different from all the tetanus vaccines and anthrax vaccines that I have uh, received throughout my uh, military career. Um, there's no live or weakened virus in the vaccine. And this is important for people to know because you cannot become infected with COVID-19 from the vaccine. Um, that is a common question that I see asked. Can I get the virus from the vaccine? And the answer is no. Um, messenger RNA or mRNA vaccines are not actually that new. Um, in terms of vaccine research, it has been a mechanism of vaccine research for over a decade. And so while it is new to the average American who uh, has never heard of this kind of vaccine, those of us who are in the vaccine immunology world um, are qu quite familiar with the safety profile of messenger RNA vaccines. One of the exciting things about this type of vaccine is that it literally delivers the blueprint for a specific part of the virus, but not the whole virus. So imagine you get a blueprint, but it's only for the front door of a house. So you can't build a house 
but you got the front door. And that's really what's important in this case. Um, so the vaccine will deliver the messenger RNA into your cells, but then your own body's cells have to provide the parts in labor. So your own cells take that blueprint and then they make the protein. Specifically, it's that spike protein. So anybody who's seen a poster or a commercial or any picture of the coronavirus, you see those spikes on the outside, kind of like push pins on the outside of it. Those are spikes. And so the vaccine is targeting that spike protein. So our own cells make it and then our immune system sees it recognizes that it is a foreign protein and it creates an immune response. That's why we get side effects like pain or fever because it's just stimulating our immune system. Then what happens is our immune system creates memory. And that's really what is so important about vaccination is that you get the benefits of immune memory without the risks of an actual infection. Uh, whether it's your chickenpox shot or a yellow fever vaccine, um, that really is one of the important components of using vaccines to help mitigate the risks of vaccine um, preventable diseases. Uh, the vaccine does not contain any preservatives or egg protein. There's no latex in the stopper. There's no adjuvant used. Um, and uh, there are a lot of people who have concerns about those elements being in the vaccine. There's really not a lot in the vaccine. It's some salt, a little bit of sugar, some stabilizer, and then these messenger RNA particles and the fat that it actually is encapsulated in that it allows it to be delivered into your individual cells. So as I've already said, side effects can happen. Um, and one of the important things about this vaccine and the fact that it is being approved under an emergency use authorization is that all of the nuances of vaccine studies have not been able to be done. So we know it is safe. We know it is effective. But things that we don't know are whether or not you can give it with another vaccine at the same time. So when we go through lengthy vaccine uh, uh, clinical trials, we look at whether giving it with a flu vaccine impacts the effectiveness, or if you pre-treat with Motrin or Tylenol, if that impacts it. So we don't have that data yet. That's the reason why um, the guidance at this point in time is not to pre-treat yourself with any sort of um, anti-inflammatory medications uh, or pain medications, but so specifically acetaminophen or Tylenol, ibuprofen or Motrin, Aleve, Naproxen. Um, you don't want to take it as a prophylactic medication to prevent side effects. However, it is safe to take it if you do have some of those side effects that I've described. So for fever, aches, soreness at the site, swelling at the site, as long as it's been about four hours since you received your shot, it is safe to go ahead and take um, a pain medication or fever medication. Um, it's not gonna uh, mute the response of your body to the vaccine. Um, an important thing is as an allergist, I have really paid a lot of attention to the concerns raised about allergic reactions to the vaccine, anaphylaxis, um, um, so for those who are not familiar with what anaphylaxis is, it is a very serious, uh, potentially life-threatening allergic reaction. Usually we think about it to like bee stings or shellfish or peanut, um, but people can have anaphylaxis to medications and vaccines are a medication. So the symptoms that you oftentimes associate um, from either someone you know or yourself or even what you see on television. So a rapid progression of an itchy rash with hives. You may get lip swelling, tongue swelling, a throat swelling, shortness of breath, wheezing. Those are the most common symptoms of anaphylaxis. And they require immediate administration of what is called injectable epinephrine, most commonly called an EpiPen. And all of our vaccination sites are equipped with the appropriate medications to administer should somebody have an anaphylactic reaction um, uh, during their observation period after receiving the vaccine. Um, now, overall, anaphylaxis to vaccines is actually very low, uh, usually about 1.3 events per million doses of a vaccine. With the coronavirus vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer, that risk is slightly higher um, than what we see with all of our other vaccines at 11.1 events 
per million doses. So for every million doses administered, about 11 people um, can be expected to have anaphylaxis. But here's the good news. The <laughs> anaphylaxis is a very treatable condition. We know how to treat it. We know how to recognize it. And of the patients who have had anaphylaxis within the United States and actually even within the UK, none of them have passed away from their anaphylaxis because their vaccination sites were prepared to recognize it and to treat it. Um, whereas we don't have a surefire quick treatment for coronavirus. So from a safety standpoint, granted, my opinion's a little skewed because I'm an allergist, but I'd rather have anaphylaxis than get COVID. Um, and, and that's just me because I've seen a lot of anaphylaxis and I know how to treat it and I know how fast the drugs can, um, uh, can resolve those symptoms. Uh, another thing uh, to take into consideration is there's a lot of misunderstandings about who cannot get the vaccine versus who just falls into kind of a precautionary group. So everybody who gets the vaccine has to wait for 15 minutes. Everybody. Um, don't shortchange yourself. Wait the 15 minutes at the site. You know, read a book, read a paper, make conversation, uh, but wait the 15 minutes. People who have a history of anaphylaxis from foods or bee stings or have had severe allergic reactions to pollen or pet dander, their wait time would be 30 minutes. And this is just really being cautionary. There's another group of people who have had potential anaphylaxis to other vaccines or to injectable medications. So if you fall into that risk category, um, you should probably just have a conversation with your allergist talk about the, the risk benefits of receiving the vaccine, um, but you can still get the vaccine. Your wait time will also be 30 minutes after vaccination. Currently, the CDC is uh, telling people who have either anaphylaxis to a COVID vaccine dose or people who have a history of anaphylaxis to polysorbate or polyethylene glycol, also called PEG, now we don't know if PEG is actually to blame for these uh, cases of anaphylaxis, but that's what we're currently suspecting. So if you have a history of anaphylaxis to PEG or polysorbate, which is very cross-reactive with PEG, or if you had anaphylaxis from your first dose, then you should not be receiving the vaccine at one of these mass vaccination sites. You should be referred to an allergist for further evaluation. And the CDC does kind of have in, in very, very small print um, the fact that within uh, the setting of an allergist supervision, you may be able to receive the vaccine with enhanced observation, um, but definitely not at the Blaisdell. Uh, and as other vaccines are uh, receive their EUA, there are going to be other opportunities for potential vaccination. So just because you had a, a serious adverse reaction or anaphylaxis from your first dose, it doesn't mean that you can never get another COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, it just means that you need to have a conversation with an allergist to figure out what the safest way to vaccinate you is going to be. Um, other things that have come up uh, pertains to the variants um, that have happened or mutations in the actual coronavirus itself. So viruses mutate, that is what they do. And the more a virus circulates in a community, the more there are mutations. So here's the good news. Um, from what we know today, the vaccines that are currently available are still effective against the UK strain, the strain coming out of South Africa, as well as the strain coming out of Brazil. We do worry though, because as continued mutations occur, could we eventually reach a point where we are no longer getting that A plus 95% efficacy or even a B minus 80% efficacy. Um, the wonderful thing about messenger RNA vaccines is that they are incredibly easy to adjust and modify. So they are very agile and scalable. So if we discover that the vaccines that we have are no longer at a satisfactory, at a satisfactory level of, of protection, then they just take what the messenger RNA would be for the new strain 
And we already know that the vaccine delivery system is safe and you just change the blueprint. So now it's not just the blueprint to the front door, you added the back door too. You added a window um, to kind of broaden the immune response that you're going to see. But as of today, from what we know, the vaccine that is currently available is also effective against these other strains. But the longer the, vac the virus circulates, the more opportunities that the virus has to mutate. So the right. faster so, we get our community vaccinated, the better. Okay, so so let me just make sure I, I, I get this right because this is top of mind to a lot of people. So as I understand it, the, the variants are mutations that happens with viruses. The current vaccines are effective against those variants. Um, it's also true that the more people that are immunized, the fewer places that the variant has to go to, to mutate to start with, right? In other words, um, if it's got nowhere to go to start with, then it's not gonna have the same damage or have, have the same spread as if it just had an open field to run with, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, and so, so let me so ask so you that's why, a, um, Go ahead. Sorry, sir. Let me just ask you a couple of uh, quick, quick ones. Um, so, so what I heard you talk about when you talked about anaphylaxis and all that stuff, um, this is what I heard. I heard that on a straight cost benefit analysis, faced with two choices, the choice of getting immunized through a vaccination and the choice of long-term effects of COVID-19 is that a no-brainer? It's an absolute no-brainer. Whatever it takes for me to not get COVID, that's the option that I'm going to go with. Because we do know now that uh, we know enough about COVID-19 at this point to know that that it it it, it affects different people differently. Um, but uh, we also know that it's not like getting a bad cold. It's not like getting the flu. There are apparently long-term effects from COVID-19. That we don't understand yet, uh, through through you know heart issues or uh, I forget what the other uh, you know clinical uh, observations have been. But the bottom line is, um, you got you got two you got two doors to open, and you're better opening the the, the vaccination door than you are opening the COVID nineteen door. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, it, we, we don't even know the mechanisms of some of these long haulers who have prolonged kind of, uh, they call it COVID brain or brain fog, um, prolonged respiratory issues, continued shortness of breath, um, cardiac issues, uh, as you've explained. And so we don't even know how to effectively uh, treat those conditions because we don't understand the mechanism. We're, we're building the plane while flying it, whereas um, the risk of arm pain, or even the risk of anaphylaxis, we know how to treat it and how to save your life. And those treatments are available, whether you're getting vaccinated uh, at Queens, at Kaiser, or at the Blaisdell, those treatments for anaphylaxis are on site. And I would rather take my chances. Now I've already been vaccinated and I didn't have any uh, uh, severe side effects, um, but it is a no brainer to me which pathway I'm gonna choose. Okay, and then another question on the variants. Um, I've heard some people say, well, I'm just gonna wait for the variants to develop a little bit more and then the vaccines kind of catch up with the variants. So I'm gonna defer my vaccinations until, until kind of all of these mutations uh, you know, unfold. And first of all, I think the answer is that mutations don't have a finite stopping point, right? I mean, in other words- They, they, they don't, do. they don't. And Okay. Yeah, and, and the problem though is, is that you don't know if the mutation is going to be more contagious or more deadly. And so, uh, you know, do I vaccinate against the devil that I know or do I wait for the devil that I don't know? And, and honestly, I would rather take the vaccine against the devil I know today than try to wait out to see what happens and potentially run the risk of getting a more severe form of COVID. Because as I said, um, the current mutations that we know are, are, are around happening around the globe, like from the UK and South Africa, um, the vaccine is still effective in not only preventing infection, but also preventing hospitalization if you do come down with a COVID infection. So it's not just about 
not getting the disease. It's about not getting a severe infection that, that leaves you in the ICU. Right. Okay. Now let me ask you one more uh, straight, straight uh, scientific question before we go to some of the other questions that are coming in. So back to the question of what actually happens when I'm immune? Can I still infect people? Do I still do I do I get a pass on on all of these uh, you know travel restrictions and and uh, you know I, I I can get together with a pod of people that have been similarly immunized? I mean, what's the science? What's the science there? Can I can I carry and transmit the COVID nineteen virus even though I've been immunized? So the short answer to that question is yes, um, because again, the vaccine is only 95% effective. So out of every 100 people that get a, a, a high exposure to COVID, five people will still get a COVID infection. And you don't know whether you're in the 95% or in the 5%. Also, um, the phase three clinical study, especially for Pfizer, did not look at asymptomatic carriers. So we are still doing research on um, the benefits of the vaccine while we're administering it. But to err on the side of caution, um, it is actually safer to continue to socially distance, wear a mask, use hand sanitizer, really good hand washing, not gather in large groups. Because even though you as a vaccinated person may not get any symptoms at all, um, if you live with someone or your coworker is immune compromised, even if they have the vaccine, their immune system is compromised, it's weaker. So while they can receive the vaccine, they may not get as robust of an immune response and would still be potentially susceptible to get coming down with COVID infection. So it continues to be a public health issue. Um, and also when you think about how long it's gonna take for us to reach that kind of magical number of herd immunity, especially because the vaccine is not yet approved for children who are spreaders of all sorts of germs. Um, Right now, even with full vaccination, two doses, um, you still are going to need to wear a mask and socially distance because the last thing you'd wanna do is inadvertently spread uh, the virus to a coworker, a colleague, a loved one. Um, and, and so that's why that extra layer of caution is still a necessary requirement. Okay, so you can still spread the virus even though you've been immunized. And when we talk about herd immunity, we're just getting to the point where enough of us are, are, um, are not going to get sick from the virus that, that that actually just reduces the risk overall, right? But it's just, a, it's a risk reduction, a significant risk reduction, just like the flu, right? Okay. Correct. Um, let's, let's uh, Hilton, if I could just kind of come back to you for a little while here, a couple of uh, questions. Uh, so let's say that I'm just, I'm listening to this and, and I wanna get vaccinated and I have no idea where to start. I don't have any idea whether I'm eligible. I have no real idea. I mean, where does somebody get the basic information about um, you know, kind of the where's and the when's and the, and the how's? Well, the Department of Health has a website, um, hawaiicovid19.com and they have a lot of information on their website. Now, there are other sources of information, the Healthcare Association of Hawaii, uh, hh.org. We have um, COVID information as well. A lot of the large, uh, the hospitals have information as well, but a really good starting point is, um, is hawaiicovid19.com. Hawaiicovid19.com. So that's, uh, of course, your doctor, if you have access to a medical professional, that is the best place to start. Right, I mean that's that's uh, they ought to be able to uh, at least advise you and direct you from that perspective. But that's at least a starting point. Um, so um, so let's say that um, let's say that uh, you you um, you utilize a community health center. That would be a place to go as well, right? Yeah, the community health centers are um, not all of them are doing COVID vaccinations, but a number of them are and more of them are coming on. So uh, the, the list is expanding. So the community, the federally qualified health centers are a very valuable resource for getting to some of those high risk populations that we have. Now, 
We, there are a number of physicians in the community would love to give the vaccine, for example. We just don't have enough vaccine right now. One of the um, issues is with the Pfizer vaccine, most people have heard about the ultra cold storage that you need, which is special refrigeration um, to, uh, to store those. And most, most doctors, most hospitals at the beginning of this pandemic did not have uh, ultra cold storage. So right now you can't go to your local physician to get it. Now, some of the pharmacies, there was an announcement just today that the federal government is going to be providing some vaccine to CVS and Walgreens pharmacies. It's going to be a small amount. Um, initially, we don't know exactly how far that's going to go, but there are a number of different places. Um, you know, physicians have the information. Your local physician is, you know, they're all interested. You know, they want to get it for themselves and their families. And, and they, they uh, generally physicians are very, very well versed. They could provide answers, but the Department of Health has answers. There's lots of places you could go, but the Department of Health website that I re referenced is a very good information source. Okay, and, and what about the cost of a vaccine? How much does it cost me to get my vaccine? Is it covered by insurance? What if I don't have insurance? Uh... Well, there are two components to any vaccine, whether you're talking about COVID or flu shot or anything else, the chicken pox or whatever. So there's the actual cost of the vaccine. And as you mentioned, Congressman, uh, the federal government is actually purchasing the vaccine and supplying it free of charge. Now, the people who actually administer the vaccine, normally they also get, like if you go to the doctor and get a flu shot, there's the, shot, there's the actual cost of the vaccine, then there's the cost of the administration or the administrative costs. Now, if all the insurers in the state, you know, HMSA, United Healthcare, um, Aloha Care, all of the health insurers, Kaiser, all of the insurers in the state are covering the cost of the administration. So if you go to any of the hospitals and FQHC, they will bill, if you have insurance, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid or commercial, they will bill the insurance for the administrative costs and most of them are paying around the, the Medicare rate, which is about $18 for the first dose and about almost $30 for the second dose. So that's covered by the insurance. If, but the vaccine itself is covered by the federal government. If you don't have insurance, I'm not, I have not heard of anyone who's actually charging that administrative fee if you don't have insurance. So the hospitals, the other places, the FQHCs, they're just absorbing that cost. Unfortunately, in Hawaii, Congressman, as you know, most people have insurance. You know, we still have 95, 94, 95% insured rate in the state. And so we, we, that's very, very well covered. So there's no out-of-pocket cost. There's no copay. There's no deductible, things like that for the COVID vaccine. There's been some, um, so, so people should go get the vaccine and, 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 and essentially not worry about it the cost of getting it. Uh, I and mean, absolutely, the cost, is, the cost is not an issue. It should not be a barrier for everyone, for anyone. And so that should not be a concern at all in terms of getting the vaccine. Okay. There's been um, um, quite a bit of uh, national uh, reporting um, on um, disparities in availability of the vaccines, uh, ethnically, socioeconomically, uh, reporting that uh, uh, some ethnic categories are overrepresented, some are underrepresented across uh, the country. Uh, we know that in Hawaii, sometimes things are different, sometimes they're not so different. Uh, we do know that we have very high risk populations, health-wise high risk populations, uh, that sometimes are, are, are also disadvantaged populations from a socioeconomic perspective. Are we doing what we need to do to, what are we doing to be sure that the vaccine is, is, is fairly available? Uh, because I, I think the last thing any of us want is for kind of this you know, privileged part of our society to get it and, and nobody else can get it. Is, is that on your mind? And how, how, do we, how do we get it to the people that actually need it and may not, may not be watching today? You know, maybe, maybe, maybe they aren't um, you know, really tied in into the system and for whatever reason, they're just, they're just not um, accessible. What are we doing to actually outreach to them? 
Well, that is a huge concern with any health concern. And one of the very good things that is going on is there's a lot of information that's being translated into multiple languages. We know what the, um, what the languages are in Hawaii. We have you know, a multi-ethnic group. I mean, you and I, congressmen, are actually minorities in Hawaii, um, you know, which is atypical for the United States. So there is a lot of information that's being translated into local, um, into a number of different languages. Information is available on the websites. There are uh, community groups that are getting involved as well. The FQHCs are for some of these populations are very, very good resource centers as well. I mean, they deal with many of these, you know, disadvantaged or lower socioeconomic, um, you know, groups within, within society. So now that being said, we're still working through the phases, which is, you know, rightly or wrongly, um, you know, we're starting off with people who work in healthcare, people in the care homes, frontline healthcare workers, emergency responders. But our goal is to get everyone in Hawaii who wants to get vaccinated. The, our goal is to get them vaccinated. We certainly hope that um, more people will get vaccinated. The numbers, you know, the official numbers or surveys are around 50 some percent. But when you look at the populations who are getting vaccinated, in health terms of healthcare workers, we have a very, very high proportion of healthcare workers, frontline responders. When we go into our care homes and our assisted living facilities, we're getting vaccination rates of 80%, 90%. There was one facility here that had 100% vaccination of its residents. And one of the things we're finding is that, you know, there was a lot more hesitancy initially on, early on. People were concerned about, you know, well, you know, is this, how safe is this? Will I get, you know, will I get these severe reactions? As those people are seeing their friends and their neighbors getting vaccinated, they're hearing about people getting vaccinated, we're finding people, for example, people in hospitals who maybe initially said, look, I'm not sure I wanna get it. You know, when we go back to do the second shot three weeks later for Pfizer or four weeks for Moderna, we're getting a lot of people coming up and saying, look, I wasn't ready three weeks ago or four weeks ago, but I'm ready now. So that is already happening and that's great to see because I would agree that with everything that's been said this evening, it's an incredibly important that we vaccinate as many people as Hawaii, because what's the alternative? You know, do we really want a lot more people to get sick? Do we want a lot more people to die? Do we want to keep wearing masks indefinitely? Do we want to keep social distancing indefinitely? I don't, you know, I've been vaccinated. I got my second shot last week. I did not, I barely knew I got it. Neither my first shot or my, first shot or my second shot. I believe that we should vaccinate and as many people as possible as quickly as possible so we can get on with our lives. Okay, and by the way, what do, what do we need to reopen our economy as well? Um, okay, so um, let's see, uh, this, this is a question, I'm just gonna whip some questions here. Uh, will the second dose administration fee be covered if they substitute a different vaccine? I think that's a pretty straightforward answer. You should not substitute another vaccine to start with, right, uh, doctor? Um, you need to stay with the, the same uh, dose for, for it to be effective, period. So, uh, yeah, so at this time, um, they did not uh, study whether or not the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are interchangeable. So when you receive your vaccine, uh, it's important to be aware of what manufacturer, did you get Moderna, did you get the Pfizer, because not not only does that impact what your second dose is, but it also impacts the timing. So the Pfizer vaccine should be received, the second dose should be received 21 days after the first, while the Moderna vaccine is 28 days after the first. Um, the CDC has said there's a four day grace period. So you can get it up to four days prior uh, to when it would be due. Um, but at this point in time, uh, they recommend that if you are gonna get the vaccine after the, that recommended time frame, to not go past the six week mark. Um, so it's not a mix and mingle interchangeable. Um, however, if for some reason you get a Moderna as the second dose when the Pfizer was the first, current recommendation is that you don't repeat any of the doses at this time. Okay, and um, just just um, again on the on the Johnson Johnson and Johnson one that may get e, uh, emergency youth authorization pretty soon. That's a that's a one dose, as I recall, with a 
with a number so far reported that still is, um, you know, it, it's 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 an it's not an A plus uh, from a, from an efficacy perspective, but it's still considered to be an effective uh, vaccine right now. But I assume that we don't want anybody waiting around just for for if they can get a if they can get the current vaccines, uh, they shouldn't be holding their breath for the Johnson and Johnson to get out there right now. Would that Hilton? Is that a fair comment? Absolutely. Um... I, you know, we know the Johnson & Johnson vaccine probably will get um, approved or emergency use authorization shortly, um, probably by the end of this month, if not sooner. But, um, you know, it's not available right now. If someone has the opportunity to get vaccinated right now with either the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine, which are very, very, both have very similar efficacy, I would definitely recommend that they just take advantage of the opportunity right now. Okay, let's see, what uh, question, what is the federal government doing to have faster, cheaper tests? I think that's actually for me, the Biden administration, that's exactly what we're debating uh, uh, this week. Uh, the Biden uh, American Rescue Plan actually has about 45 billion in it to procure and administer regular screening tests. And, and um, uh, that needs to get out there. These, these tests are, are getting a lot faster, a lot more available. Uh, but it's a good question, Hilton. What if what if somebody actually wants to go out and get tested? Uh, what's the best way? I guess the same avenue as a vaccine. I mean, you should go through your medical provider, but you know sometimes you don't have time to go to your medical provider. You just have you just want to get it right away. Um, how do we? How do how do people get tests nowadays? Nice and easy. Well, there's lots of ways you can get tests right now, and there's um, there's plenty of tests around. You can go to uh, one of the pharmacies to get a test, CVS or Walgreens, some of the other pharmacies. You can go to your doctor's office. There's, there's the variety of ways of getting tests. And the, uh, uh, the federal government has just partnered with an Australian company actually to, on, on a test, which is a, um, an at-home test. Um, that won't be available till later this year, but there is plenty of testing capability available in Hawaii right now. Okay. Uh, let's see, we've got a question here. Will Hawaii adopt early access for vaccination for high infection risk subpopulations as a group? I think the answer to that is yes, you already answered that, Hilton. I think, I think that, is, that is, as I recall, the next phase, 1C, which is to go straight to um, high risk groups across the board, right? That is correct, yes. Okay, and I think um, maybe, and I'm not sure from the question whether that, um, the high risk was referring to medical medical conditions per se. So, for example, somebody that had a had a medical condition that put them at much higher risk uh, to COVID nineteen, regardless of age, or whether that was more of a of an ethnic and socioeconomic group uh, classification. Is there is there any thought to 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 prioritize uh, from the latter perspective, or is that more a function of just of of just um, the general prevalence of some of the medical conditions that would give you a higher uh, level of, of COVID-19 exposure to start with. How, how, do, we get, uh, how do we get the, the vaccine to the groups that actually need them faster, not just from a medical condition perspective? I think that's the question. Yeah, the, um, you know, it's a very challenging question and there is no guidance right now about doing something simply based on race and simply saying, if you're a particular race, you should get it, you know, uh, ahead of someone else. So really right now, again, is what industry classification are you in? If you're a first responder, doesn't matter, you know, what race you are, you know, what color skin you have, you get it. If you work in a hospital, if you're a healthcare provider, you get it. If you're a teacher right now in Hawaii, you know, they don't ask you what's your race, that's got nothing to do with it. So now in, in terms of those high risk populations, if you are sick, if you are, you know, if you've got a disease and you're, um, you know, 65, 40, whatever, uh, underlying chronic conditions, you're not being vaccinated right now, but you will be in that next group. But if you are a, you know, Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian, for example, and you're a healthy 25 year old, 45 year old, 65 year old, you don't, you get no special um, dispensation right now. It's just not the way it's working. Okay, well, that's, a, that, that's straight. Um, we, we do know that in, in some, of the, some of the ethnic populations, 
medical conditions are especially prevalent, for example, um, um, you know, diabetes and related kidney disease, which would be a high indicator for COVID-19 risk. So from the medical perspective, uh, that, would, that would indicate some, some priority on, the, on, the, on, the, on that side, right? Yes, absolutely. So when we get to that next group, which is people with high risk conditions or chronic conditions, what it will mean in reality is that a higher proportion of native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders will be vaccinated because unfortunately, they do have higher rates of diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, things like that. So, okay. so yeah, more of those people will be vaccinated when we get more of those populations will be vaccinated when we get to that group. And some of them actually are getting it right now through those FQHCs because the FQHCs, if they get sick people showing up or people with chronic conditions, they will, they will uh, vaccinate a number of those individuals. Yeah, and that refers to our community health centers. That's, a, that's a, the term we all use, FQHCs, but that's what it means, our community health centers. That so, is correct, yes. So, you know, uh, uh, Kaliki Palama um, um, and, you know, West Hawaii, et cetera. Yeah, Wainai Coast, they're on all the, Coast. Islands, all, the, all the neighbor islands, you know, Bay Clinic, they're, in, they're, they're all over the state. Um, if I am a, let's see, I'm just, I'm just looking at some more questions. If I'm a veteran, um, if I'm a veteran and I, and I want a vaccine, am I, am I better, what's the availability in the veterans healthcare system for, for vaccinations? You, you said earlier that the army was taking care, I mean, the military rather was taking care of its own. Um, is that true of veterans as well, or do they go to their healthcare provider, whoever that is, which might be a private uh, non-VA system provider? Well, the Department of Defense, the VA, and the Indian Health Service all have their own separate distribution streams. So people who are in, you know, in either of those three categories, and in Hawaii, we don't have a lot of, you know, Native, Native Americans, but here we have a number of VA and DOD personnel, Department of Defense personnel. And if you're a VA person, you could actually, you know, you could either go through the VA system or you could go through, you know, just go to one of the hospitals or one of the other centers. So you've got a choice. Now, Department of Defense, you know, you've got a choice as well, but, you know, the Department of Defense, again, they have their own allocation and they are working through the phases as well. So, so that, they're using the same phased approach. Thus, starting with the, the you know older people, people with underlying conditions, but there's a smaller number. You know, Department of Defense, for example, you know, there's not a lot of people over 75 who are in the Department of you know who are DOD personnel right now. So, but they they have their own separate distribution channels. But again, someone in the VA they could go either way. It would okay. not be a problem. All right, uh, let's see, question. CNN reports that we are in the bottom five of the states that have done vaccinations. Uh, what are we doing to fix that? And I think this refers to um, available vaccines versus number of people actually vaccinated. So in other words, the question is, why, why, aren't, why aren't the, um, the, the actual vaccines keeping up with the availability of vaccines? I don't think that's true anymore, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, are we, we're pretty close to full utilization now of the available vaccines, do you know? Yeah, that is an old number. And there, there is a problem with the data lag. We're getting better and better every week in terms of shortening the gap between vaccines arriving in the state and actually what we call shots in arms, which is actually given the vaccine. So. That, that is an old number. We're actually doing very, very well. As of today, we have administered about 170,000 doses in the state of Hawaii. So we, now, was it a slow start? Yeah, it was a slow start. You know, it was, it was December, we're getting into Christmas, New Year's, you know, and it took a while for people to build up their systems, our hospitals to get going, our FQHCs to get going. But as I just said, as I said in my comments earlier, we actually have way more capacity now than what we have vaccines. So, the, so we're getting shots in arms much, much faster. We have got very, very good systems. What we need right now is just more vaccine. Right. Okay, and then last question, uh, doctor, um, which vaccine should I get, Pfizer or Moderna, or do I have that option? Does it, does it, does it significantly matter, or do I just get whatever vaccine I can get? I mean, they're coming in different channels, is my is my understanding. You know, one is going into you know the the the, um, the kind of the 
healthcare provider channel and the other one is going to teachers. And so it, but does it, does it really matter as a practical matter from a scientific perspective? No, it doesn't. The vaccine you should choose is whichever one you can get in your arm the soonest. Okay, that was a nice short, sweet answer. All right, we're, um, we've got a couple of others, but I'll try to answer them uh, uh, offline um, as, as, we, as we finish up here. And, and I don't wanna keep you or anybody else uh, going that long. Um, so can, any, any concluding thoughts? Like what do you want people to know that you just don't think might be getting across to everybody? Uh, Dr. Boothia, let's just start with you. So, you know, one of the things that I, I've told uh, people who've reached out to me personally and, and just asked, um, is it really that thing? Uh, you know, I, I equate it to you know, uh, never, never trust a chef that wouldn't eat his own food, but definitely trust a chef that not only eats his own food, but brings it home to his family. Um, and so not only have I been vaccinated, but I have been encouraging my family, my friends, my friend's family, uh, my, my colleagues who are on the, on the fence about this to receive the vaccine, um, because I really do believe that this is such an important public health uh, strategy in order to, to eventually get back to normal. And, and I know we all would like to go back to normal and birthday parties and barbecues and cookouts and, and, and um, by getting vaccinated, that's our, that's our way to get there um, as fast and as safely as possible. Uh, so when all the doctors in the room have received the vaccine, um, that's, that should be a, an ind indicator um, that the vaccine is not only uh, gonna be effective, but that it is also safe and that it's embraced by uh, the physician and healthcare community. Okay, and, and by the way, just to round out the group, I've also um, uh, been vaccinated in connection uh, with uh, being a member of Congress and the strong advice of our attending physician here uh, who has told every member of Congress to get vaccinated from a continuity of government uh, perspective. Uh, and uh, the symptom that I felt was uh, uh, some, some pain in the shot site for um, about a day or two afterwards. So that's, that's my own personal uh, testament in history. Okay, uh, uh, Hilton Rathel, uh, last uh, questions you want anybody to know that uh, maybe we haven't covered? Well, no, I just, um, vaccines have proven for decades, many, many decades to be a huge boon to society and public health. There has been a huge amount of research done on these vaccines by multiple governments it's not just the US government, it's other governments as well. And these are vaccines that we need to take to turn the tide of this pandemic, to get to that herd immunity, stop, stop these mutations. And we should not be hanging around waiting to see, okay, which one is gonna cover you know, five, six different uh, vac uh, mutations. Do you really wanna run the risk of catching COVID and either getting, you know, ha ending up in an ICU, having some of these long-term effects or even dying. Do you want to take that risk rather than getting a shot and getting a sore arm? It's not for me. Thank you. All right, well, that's a pretty stark way of putting it, but it is the reality. Um, I, uh, I really appreciate both of you uh, joining me tonight to, to get, out, uh, get out the word on vaccinations. Uh, I learned a lot myself uh, that, that you passed along here people that are listening uh, have learned a lot as well. Um, here's the bottom line. Um, like I said at the very beginning, uh, COVID-19, the solution, uh, the path to, to overcoming that crisis lies through public health and the path to public health lies through vaccinations. I think it's, uh, it's about as simple as that. Uh, so everything that we really want and need for our Hawaii or for our country or for our world for that matter depends on us. Uh, continuing to try to get ourselves uh, widely vaccinated as, as, as quickly and as safely and as efficiently as possible. Uh, we certainly have that responsibility uh, in Congress to make sure that, that uh, the vaccinations are, continue to be uh, manufactured and distributed in high volumes. Uh, and in Hawaii, we have the responsibility of uh, distributing uh, uh, them in a efficient, fast and safe and fair way. Uh, and uh, obviously the, the medical science part of this is critical to try to answer 
uh, uh, fear uh, often uh, of folks uh, that needs to be uh, grounded in some reality. And so uh, these uh, partnerships and discussions are really critical as we go down the road here. And, and, and we hope that if we do everything right, uh, that um, somewhere around the middle of this year, we will really start to see uh, the effects of uh, what we are all trying to do uh, right now. Uh, that's a realistic possibility as long as we all uh, stay with stay with it. Um, any further questions, uh, please uh, email me at ed.case at mail.house.gov, ed.case at mail.house.gov. Um, if I can answer any of your questions or, or listen to any of your guidance on the federal side of COVID-19, on the state administrative side of COVID-19, or in your own individual cases, my office is open and available for you to do that. Uh, the quickest way into my office is my website at case.house.gov. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening or now good morning in Washington, D.C. and aloha.